Hello everyone that's joined so far. We're gonna wait just a couple more seconds to get started. See if we have anybody else trickle in as it's just now getting to three o'clock. I'm out here at Fort Humboldt State Historic Park. Looks like we're getting a couple more people joining us here. Welcome everyone, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Gonna go on a little walk here in just a moment, get some more views of the park, and talk a little bit about this place. Okay, let's get started. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in. My name is Kyle, I work for California State Parks, and today we are out at the beautiful Fort Humboldt State Historic Park. And now this park, you might be wondering if you've been up on the North Coast before, where is this place? Where am I today? Uh, I didn't see this park on the brochure or on the map. Um, this park is actually right in the middle of Eureka, so often it is overlooked with all of our spectacular redwood parks. Um, you don't necessarily see this historic park advertised as much, but it is a beautiful place, a nice open field. We've got some historic buildings here and a history that's uh, really kind of an integral part to the history of the rest of Humboldt. So I'm going to take a walk over here. We have some views and uh, talk a little bit about the history. Um, if you guys have been tuning into our live streams, just know they're happening every day at three o'clock. So you can always tune in any day of the week, um, Sunday through Saturday, 3 p.m. every day, there will be different interpreters giving different programs from all kinds of parks all over, um, all over the state parks up here on the North Coast. Uh, also want to apologize, uh, the video today is going to be a little bit shaky. I'm just on my phone here. I don't have a gimbal or anything to help stabilize. Um, so let me know if you guys want me to stop for a second and get a better view of something if, uh, if we're a little bit too shaky. So again, my name is Kyle. I work for California State Parks. We're out here at Fort Humboldt State Historic Park, right in the middle of Eureka. So I'm going to flip the camera around here in a second. If you've ever been on the 101, Highway 101 through Eureka, um, you've probably seen the Bayshore Mall here. We have a big old mall right on the 101, and right across the street there's this historic military fort where I am standing here today. Um, and you might be wondering, why is there a military fort right in the middle of Eureka? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, before we get started, I just want to recognize a lot of you guys are at home today. Um, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate that. I'm also following the guidelines on our um, on a coronavirus. I have washed my hands before this and I will do again afterwards. I've sanitized my device and we'll make sure to do so again before anybody else is using it. Um, while our parks are open, we are making sure that we are keeping at least six feet distance from anyone else um, who might be enjoying them today. So you might see me distancing myself from some other people. So back to the fort. Where am I? Why am I here? Why is this place here? Um, before we do get started, I just want to recognize I'm going to be talking about the um, Native American communities in this area. This is ancestral Wiat land. I'm going to be using terms like native people, indigenous people, um, first people of this land to reference them, but I just want to recognize that there's not a perfect term to refer collectively to a group of indigenous people, and in most cases it's best to ask an individual what they prefer. So, I'm going to flip you around here so you can get a view while we walk and talk a little bit about this historic fort. So, this fort was created in 1853, and this was partially a result of the popularity of gold mining. So back in those times, there was not a lot of people living here. If you can't imagine, there was no Bayshore Mall. That was actually a marshland coming all the way up to the base of this bluff. Behind me, where there is now housing tracks, uh, you can't quite see them through the trees there, but instead of a one line of trees, we would have an entire dense redwood forest on the back side of this bluff. And as I mentioned before, this is the ancestral land of the Wiat people. And the Wiat people lived in this bay right here, where they could get everything that they needed. All the food, um, they could get sturgeon, shellfish, all kinds of things from the bay. Everything they couldn't get right here, they could head on to the forest, hunt elk and deer, collect berries. And one of the most important things in a redwood forest made of giant, massive redwood trees, what do you guys think might have been an important resource in a redwood forest with massive redwood trees? Give a couple seconds to see if anybody wants to reply. Okay, I'll give it away. 
It was the redwood trees. Redwood trees were a huge part um, of what the Wiyot people did. In fact, they made canoes out of redwood trees. What they would do, let's, uh, let's walk over here where we have a big old stump. So they would use the redwood trees to make magnificent canoes, but the respect that the Wiyot people showed for this land uh, showed in so many things that they did. The land here was sacred to them and everything in it was sacred. So rather than just cutting down a tree and turning it into a canoe, they would wait for a tree to fall due to natural causes. They would not cut down any trees. And they would take this tree, the densest part of the wood on a tree is right in the middle, the heartwood. And if I made a canoe out of a tree, I would think I would slice this tree right in half and make two canoes out of it. However, my canoes wouldn't float very well because that dense part of the tree would be right at the top of my canoe. I'll show you when I get over to this, uh, these logs, we can see a little bit better. So if I was going to turn this big old log into a canoe, I would slice right across the middle, turn it into two canoes. But the dense wood right here in the middle would then be on the top of my canoe and would make my canoe want to flip over. We all people knew this, and instead they would cut kind of a U-shape into the tree. And that way the dense wood right at the center was the very bottom of their canoe. And that would mean that the densest part of that boat that they were in was on the very bottom, helping the boat to stay naturally buoyant. So it's just an example of how well they knew their environment um, to manipulate it in respectful ways to kind of best meet their needs. So they would use those canoes to go out and hunt and fish and collect all kinds of things. And for everything that they couldn't get right from this bay, they were able to trade with some local tribes for it. So you can see the Wiat right here on the bay some of the other tribes in the area, they could go, and those redwood canoes that they made were really, they were really renowned, and they could trade with people all over the place to get whatever else they may not be able to access right in their own um, area that they lived in. And for thousands and thousands of years, from time immemorial, this is how life existed out on Humboldt Bay and the surrounding area of Humboldt as we know it. But right around 1850, or yeah, 1849, 1850, there was a big change in what was happening in the rest of America that really uh, brought a huge amount of people coming up to Fort Humboldt. Does anybody know what that amazing, uh, that big event in California around the 49, 1850? People were looking for a really valuable resource, shiny. You may have panned for it when you were in fourth or fifth grade. I'm talking about gold, the gold rush. So the gold rush really brought a ton of people flooding into this area. Um, yay, Sophie, gold rush, thank you very much. Yes, the gold rush really brought a ton of people flooding to this area. And while they weren't here per se, right on Humboldt Bay, they were inland at what's called the Trinity River. And it wasn't the biggest gold mine ever, but there was enough gold that they were finding there that they found it desirable to bring it back down to where they could sell it. At this point, there was no big settlement up here on the North Coast. And so once people had their pockets full of gold, they wanted to go down and spend it. They'd head down to Sacramento or San Francisco. And often that trip so far was inland. It was a big, long trip um, headed down south inland from the Trinity River. So it became desirable that they wanted to kind of, uh, they wanted to ship this gold down south to be a little bit easier than taking packs of mules down by land. So, they sent the first overland voyage of people to try and find Humboldt Bay. This was called the Gregg Party, led by Josiah Gregg. And they were told when they were preparing for this expedition that it would take them about two weeks. About ten days is what they were told. So they packed enough food for ten days, thinking it'd be a, it'd be a quick little trip through the redwood forest. They'd find this beautiful Humboldt Bay, and they'd be able to start shipping gold south, famous for their discovery. They found their journey a little bit more treacherous than they earlier thought. It was said that they averaged about a mile a day while they were traveling through the redwood forest. They were mauled by grizzly bears, and every time they made it through a forest, they'd find a snow-capped mountain on the other side with another forest on the other side of that mountain. Their journey was incredibly difficult, and it took them months to get here. Not two weeks, months. It was January of 1853 by the time they finally made it out to Humboldt Bay. It was freezing cold. They were starving. They made it out to Samoa. They didn't quite make it to the bay. They were on the other side of the, of the bay from where we're at now. 
they were exhausted. And thankfully, there was a little village, Vuyat, right near here, right about where McDonald's is today, called Kutswalik. Thankfully, the people living at that village, Kutswalik, rode over to the strange people hanging out uh, across the bay, brought them back to their village, nursed them back to health, and um, kind of helped them get back on their feet for their journey home. Just to give you an idea of the, uh, the mentality of the early settlers and people coming to this area, there had been 200 years of fighting with native people throughout the rest of California, or through the rest of the United States. So by the time people had arrived up here on the north coast, um, there was quite a stigma against the native people living here. These people weren't considered humans and didn't have the same rights as the people who were coming down here um, looking to settle. So when that Josiah Gregg's party first discovered, or first came across this village of Kutswalik, um, as they were leaving, one of their members, David Buck, carved into a nearby tree, Buck's Port, claiming this area as his own. Shortly thereafter, this would be the town of Bucksport, a thriving little community um, with a port, tons of lumber mills for the nearby Redwood, and the village of Kutswalik would no longer be there. This is how a lot of the early interactions went between the native people up here and the settlers coming in. The settlers would want something from the area and they would push the native people out. You can think about this as somebody uh, coming into your home and just starting to live there, slowly pushing you out and eventually not letting you back into your own house. So oftentimes these back and forth led to disagreements, arguments, and eventually bloodshed. And this got bad enough that by the time, by uh, February of 1853, the government decided they needed to intervene, and the first steamer carrying U.S. troops came up from San Francisco. That was also an incredibly difficult voyage. Um, at that time, Humboldt Bay was not dredged for larger ships, and there was a sandbar that went across that was very difficult to cross, and it could only be attempted at certain tides. So they had to wait for an extra high tide to even be able to sail into the bay. What, uh, you know, what now is a six-hour drive between Humboldt and San Francisco took at least five days by steamboat. And in the case of our very first voyage coming up here to Humboldt Bay, it took them 10 days. It was the middle of February. It was freezing cold. And by the time they got here, many of the soldiers were sick on board. It's also important to note that many of the soldiers on that first voyage were fresh immigrants to the United States coming from Ireland and other places. Um, they were, you would arrive in San Francisco, they'd be promised this great life, join the military, we'll send you north to this land of untapped opportunity, and they would take advantage of that, thinking that this was a great deal. When they got here, however, they were pretty disappointed. Um, when they arrived, there was nothing on this bluff. It was barren. It is naturally so, being an ancient uplifted ocean terrace, it doesn't have a lot of trees growing on it naturally. So as those first troops sailed into Humboldt Bay, they realized that this could be a really good place for a fort, being flat, void of trees, and having a pretty good view over the bay. Now there was um, some established settlements here. There was Eureka, a little bit further north of where I'm standing now, which now I'm in Eureka. Um, Bucksport was right about where we are, and then further north, what is now Arcata, was called Union. These were kind of the three towns that were going at this time. But it was not the soldiers' jobs to join in the local communities. It was their job to establish what would become Fort Humboldt. When they marched up here, it was freezing cold, February of 1853. They were told to sleep right on the ground, uh, pouring rain, soggy ground of this, um, this field that we stand in today. And they figured that they couldn't really do a whole lot about this conflict that they were assigned to deal with. It was their job to mitigate conflict between the natives and the settlers. And the settlers at that time wanted extermination of the native people, and the native people wanted to be left alone. So a lot of the soldiers here, a lot of the entire fort, spent a lot of their energy building up the fort. The building right across from us now is similar to one of the very first buildings built, a recreated surgeon's quarters. A surgeon was one of the first, uh, a house for a surgeon is one of the first buildings that was built. And that was the case for a lot of the early buildings were built for members of high society, surgeons, generals, higher ranking people, while the soldiers slept still out here on the ground. 
If you tune in again on Saturday, we're gonna head on into that house and learn a little bit more what life was like for some of the soldiers living here at Fort Humboldt. Um, a bunch of letters were written by the person who resided there named Harriet Simpson. Um, her letters were in such detail that it helped the Park Service to recreate this, um, this house kind of in her memory. So tune in on Saturday again at 3 p.m. I'll be touring some of the houses and talking a little bit more um, about the history and the experience of some of the soldiers. If you guys have any questions about anything we've covered so far today, I'll be hanging around for another couple of minutes, but tune in again on Saturday. We'll visit the buildings. We'll talk a little bit more about Fort Humboldt's history, and we'll continue the story from here uh, about what happened to the soldiers, the settlers, and the native people in this community. Thank you guys all so much for tuning in. I'm going to go sanitize this and wash my hands one more time. Harriet the lady. Mmm, that lady. Harriet Simpson uh, was, the, was the wife of the surgeon who helped to create that house. Um, anyway, tune in again on Saturday, 3 p.m. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Tune in again tomorrow to hear a little bit about Yurok culture and uh, a little bit more about some of the indigenous communities in this area. Thank you again all so much for joining. Um, I'll just present some beautiful views since there are still so many of you on this live stream as I walk on back to uh, my office. And if you do have any questions, please let me know. Thanks for the feedback, Barnin. Thank you, Griff. Anytime. Come back. Again, we'll be doing these every day at 3 p.m., so tune in whenever you can. There'll always be a live interpreter on the other side to ask, uh, to answer your questions, show you around some beautiful parks, um, get some history, get some culture, get some nature. Thank you all. Uh, temperature here right now. Um, I would say it's probably close to 70. It's actually pretty warm today. We're getting a little bit of rain on and off. It's sprinkling on me right this second. Um, but we have pretty comfortable temperatures. Wow, I guessed 70. I guess my internal temperature gauge is off. It's about 50 degrees here right now. But a warm 50, a warm 50. We're getting a little bit of sun and a little bit of rain at the same time. Thank you again everybody for tuning in come back tomorrow at 3 p.m to learn something new come back saturday at 3 p.m to learn a little bit more about fort humboldt thanks again you guys talk to you soon